Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. All right, let me just say before we start, Destin is a funny thing. Um, I don't think Destin is particularly something that is pre-planned in all its elements. I think it's something that you collide with. And to collide with destiny, it means you need to be in the right place at the right time for the right thing. And when you do that, somehow you collide with destiny. And I've tried to set the values of my life and the commitments that I hold to where I could collide best as possible with, with the destinies that God has put as potential for my life. And if you live life by that values, you will collide with them. I don't know why I said that and planned to say that, but I needed to say it. All right. So, uh, I want to bring you some elements tonight which just came to me this, this afternoon because I was preparing actually to talk about this, but it's obviously not, it's not the night to talk about that. And so I, I really felt I heard God, you know, stirring my spirit um, to bring you some elements from uh, some thoughts that I first began developing in 2001 and brought them as part of a series. And this was part of some of the conclusions that I drew at that time, but obviously we have changed and time has changed and therefore um, some of the thoughts that I have about this have changed a little bit, but I really felt very burdened that this is what I needed to bring tonight. So I want to talk to you about dealing with discouragement. Very important subject, dealing with discouragement. Um, discouragement is like the bite of a venomous snake. It will debilitate you. Your ability to think and function will become compromised. It will cause you to bleed to death from the inside out, from the turmoil that you're wrestling with. It will cause you pain, and ultimately, it will kill you and your dreams along with it if you don't know how to deal with discouragement. The potential for discouragement will occur regularly in the course of your life and you will invariably suffer discouragement. And some of you have got it right now. Some of you are listening to me online and on the broadcast right now are suffering from discouragement. Knowing how to recognize it and what to, what, what to do about it could save your life along with your hopes and dreams. So I want to introduce you to uh, a piece of scripture from the Old Testament that, that helps to express the thoughts that go around explaining what discouragement is and how we can deal with it. And it's Numbers chapter 21. I'm going to read this from the New King James Version of the Bible and I'm going to make comments as we go along with the reading. Okay, so verse 4. Then they journeyed, that's the children of Israel who have come out of Egypt and are on the way to the land of promise. Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. Listen to this. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. Now, some of the Bible versions replace the word discouraged with the word impatient, but they're actually the same concept in the Hebrew language. Because when you become impatient about something occurring, happening, taking place, getting fixed, you know, something turning in your life, you become discouraged in the process of that impatience. So the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way, on the journey. Now, that Hebrew word that is translated discouraged is an interesting word because it means to, to, to one of the meanings is, and I'll give you a couple of the meanings, one of the meanings is to dock off. Okay, now, now let me give you two examples of that because it's a picture word. One is, you know when you take a dog and you chop its tail off? It's called docking. Okay, so the poor dog can no longer express itself in the full magnitude of its ability now that you have removed its main tool for expressing its joy, you have docked it off. 
And so we never think that the poor little dog with its docked off tail might have a sense of discouragement because it can't express itself in the way that it would like to. Discouragement is also about coming up short, about there being a lack, and uh, it, it also means to become disconnected from. So that concept of dock off, if you think of a ship in the ar- harbor, we call it a dock. Why? Because it comes into the dock. But if the ropes are loose, the, the ship will, will gradually move away from the dock. So it's no longer got firm ground, but it, it's now drifting because it's not docked on, it's docked off. And so one of the major expressions to, 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 to show this word discouragement is to become disconnected from. We become discouraged because we became disconnected from. If you are discouraged, it's because you have become disconnected from something. Now, the way I expressed that back in 2001 was, was truth, righteousness, and God's plan for your life. I now would have to talk to you about what I mean by God's plan for your life. I'd have to talk to you about what I mean by righteousness. Uh, and also a little bit about what I mean for, by truth. So you are a different audience to the one we had them, and I'm a different person. So here's how I would put it now. It's becoming disconnected from the ability to delineate truth in its righteous and proper context. You become discouraged when you become disconnected from the ability to delineate truth in its righteous and proper context. You are not reading life correctly. That's why you are discouraged. And that, of course, affects my whole belief system, which discouragement does. So I also want you to notice in verse 4, it says it was the soul of the people that became discouraged. Discouragement is not just a feeling in the emotions. Discouragement is something that happens at the level of your soul. It happens deep within you, and unless you deal with it deeply, you will never resolve the issue of your discouragement and never become reconnected to what it was you have become disconnected from. And your ability to delineate truth in its right and proper context will never be re-established unless you deal with that discouragement at soul level. Discouragement is not resolved by finding three people who agree with your grievance. All that does is rub oil on your emotions but it doesn't fix the hole in your soul. So the word there is the soul of the people became discouraged. Now, it's interesting because there's another verse that I am familiar with from my growing up in church in in the book of Proverbs in chapter 23 and verse 7. And, And this is the verse as I was taught it, for as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. You truly are what you're thinking in your heart. Therefore, if your heart is in a state of delineated truth and and righteousness in its proper context, that you're not seeing the world correctly, that you're no longer able to, to understand what is going on around you, then the truth is as you think in your heart, so you are. So what's going on in your heart is who you are. And it's who you will be. And nothing on the outside will fix that, it will only suppress that. And so in life, we are used to medicating problems. We medicate problems. We don't fix problems, we medicate problems. And so one of the ways that we deal, even this week, it's come up about mental health issues and with Prince Harry talking about the loss of his mother and how he went into depression. And I talked to you last week about how I spent three and a half years battling depression. But what we tend to do is rather than find the root, we medicate it. We give pills and drugs that make us not feel how we would feel if we didn't have the pills and drugs. And when the pills and drugs have gone, we feel that way because nothing was fixed. And we medicate illness and we medicate situations. And dear old Jamie, who we will bury in, in a week on Friday, Jamie was medicating his pain with alcohol. It was a medicine to Jamie. He was medicating his pain. He was medicating his guilt. And we do it through drugs, we do it through alcohol, 
we, we can do it through relationships, multiple relationships, trying to medicate my sense of a lack of self-worth or my inadequacy by having multiple sexual relationships, feeling that if somebody loves me enough to have sex with me, I'm bound to be okay. And it's all trying to medicate something that we're not dealing with at the root. And at the root of it all is a discouragement. And discouragement is not an outward emotion, it's a condition of the heart, it's a condition of the soul. And so when it says in Proverbs 23 verse seven, as a man thinks in his heart, it's the same word that is translated soul in Numbers 21 verse four, okay? So what's going on in here is who you are. You can medicate it, and as they say, you can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time, and you can't fool God none of the time. So why fool yourself if you ain't fooling God and you want to get fixed? Therefore, discouragement comes from what I believe on the inside, not what I see on the outside. So the root of my discouragement is not actually what I'm seeing on the outside. It's coming from what I believe on the inside. That's why I become discouraged, why you become discouraged. Now, that affects my ability to listen. It affects my ability in particular to listen to leaders. Now, now let's not just confine this to church because you'll think I'm just trying to give myself more authority. It does the same thing in industry. It does the same thing in the family. A discouraged child who is not fixing what's going on on the inside and it may be they feel the invisible child or they've never been nurtured or they don't feel loved or they feel inadequate will go through all the things that we would go through and describe on a spiritual level and what happens in those situations is that the ability to listen becomes affected and so the child the employee the member will go and do stuff now of course in this context it is the same with Bible leaders. You will stop listening to me when you are discouraged. And the reason you'll stop listening is because your ability to delineate truth in its righteous and proper context has been affected by your disconnection and that has affected your belief system. So now, all of a sudden, leaders are not trustworthy. Now, I'm in good company with this. Because I think anybody who does even just a cursory study of leadership would have to say Moses was a great leader. But Moses had a difficult time leading the children of Israel. One of the reasons was anybody can lead people where they want to go. It takes a real leader to lead people where they need to go. And the problem is a lot of what we exalt as leadership is only leading people where they want to go. Let's give them what they want. Let's create the environment that we want and people will gather to that. But listen, it's not going anywhere. It's just walking on the spot. It's having a party until the truth dawns. So one of the things that happens here, and it's contained in this scripture, is it affects my ability to listen to leaders in particular. Here's, here's what the Bible says in Exodus chapter 6 and verse 9. They did not heed or listen to Moses, listen to this, because of anguish of spirit. In this verse, go back to where you were, go back to that one you had, I like the anguish of spirit. And now here in New King James, uh, or is this the NIV? Oh, we back. The, the word anguish of spirit, that word anguish, is the same word translated that we translate discouragement. It's the same word. So they did not listen to Moses because of discouragement, which is anguish of spirit. And, go back to the other verse, and cruel bondage. Now, that word and is very important. Because without that and, you would say they are discouraged because of cruel bondage. They are discouraged because of what's happening to them in life. But here it says discouragement and cruel bondage because of anguish of spirit and cruel bondage. Therefore, their discouragement was not connected to their cruel bondage. In fact, their discouragement was not the result of cruel bondage 
their discouragement is not caused by wounds, it's caused by beliefs. And this is the point, discouragement is not caused by wounds. Discouragement is caused by belief. Now we think if somebody is wounded, that's the reason they're discouraged. No, it's not. Because there are many people who've borne a lot of wounds who are not discouraged or disconnected from a true understanding of life. It was not the wounds, it's the beliefs that caused the discouragement, not the wounds. Jesus was not discouraged for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross because he was not disconnected from a correct understanding of truth. Therefore, our wounds are not the cause of our discouragement. What we've believed is the cause of our discouragement. I'm saying that because what we do is we look for reasons. Well, I'm discouraged because I was hurt. I'm discouraged because somebody did this. I'm discouraged because I lost my job. No, you're discouraged because of what you believe. Because it's at soul level. Okay? Now let's work on that a little bit. Therefore, discouragement is not the effect of my problem, but the cause of it. So if I can fix the discouragement... I can change the effect. But if we're trying to change the effect, we'll never fix the discouragement because the effect has been caused by the discouragement. It is not the cause of the discouragement. So I could define discouragement at this point in this way. It's the result of my interpretation of what I see measured against what I expected or believed. Now, that can be in the context of a situation, it can be in the context of a person, it can be in the context of a relationship, but discouragement is the result of my interpretation of what I see measured against what I expected or believed. You will be let down, get over it. People will fail you, get used to it. But if you do not want to live in a constant state of discouragement, you have to deal with what you expected and what you believed measured against the interpretation of what you see. That's why Jesus gave us an interpretation for people. Love your enemies. Forgive. Pray for those who despitefully use you. That you can't hold a grudge. So here's what it caused them to do. This is what discouragement caused these people to do. We come back to our main scripture and verse 5. The people spoke against. Now I'm going to put the two words in there in a minute. But when we become discouraged, the tendency is to have an againstness. Okay? We're not oozing love and forgiveness. What we're oozing is I'm, I'm going to be against something. I just might not have chosen who it is or what it is that I'm going to be against yet, but I'm going to be against something because someone or something is the cause of the way I feel, when actually, no, your discouragement is the cause of the way you feel, and that's because of what you have believed against what you expected or thought, and that's what's causing the problem. And so the people spoke against, now they spoke against God and against Moses, now, most of it was against Moses, and this, this is an interesting, sobering thought. Moses happened to be the one God appointed to lead this thing. So when you spoke against Moses, you spoke against God. Now, we don't, we don't say many things like that here because I'm not trying to bring you to a place of, of intimidation or fear, but sometimes we have to say it like it is. If I put somebody in a position of authority and you speak against them, you speak against me. You know, if you want to fight Danny, you're fighting me as well, okay? You want to fight Joel, you're fighting me as well. You want to fight Amy, you're fighting me as well. Why? Because they are in a position that I have placed them in and Chris has placed them in. So when God puts people in place and you fight those people, you fight God in the same time. Just read the scriptures if you don't agree with me and uh, have a conversation if you've still got a problem. The people spoke a bit against God and against Moses. And their unhappiness manifested in a particular way. And this, I find this interesting. What happened was they made statements in the form of questions. Now, we like to do that because it kind of, sort of, seems to excuse us from being critical. 
So, do you think the church is going in the right direction? Question mark. Is what's put in place for, I think the church is going in the wrong direction. Let me show you how it worked in here. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Well, why not just say, Moses, we think you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness and we're not happy. But you see, they kind of felt better about themselves because well, we're not being critical. We're not being judgmental. It was just a question. Why have you brought us out into the wilderness to die? But can you see it was a statement in the form of a question that actually had a destructive element to it that seemed to have a kind of righteousness, but it wasn't. And it distorted their perception of their situation, leading to the crazy situation of seeing lies as truth and truth as lies, and to devalue that which was actually the very source of their life. Here it goes in verse 5. For there is no food and water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. Now my question would be, how can you be alive saying there's no food and water if there's no food and water? So they have made a truth, there was food and water, into a lie, there is no food and water. And they said, we hate this loathsome bread. Now how many of you know what that bread was called biblically? It was called manna. Who sent it every morning? God. Now you've got people who are loathing what God sent. Therefore, it's possible for God to be at work sending us something and for us to begin to loathe what it is that God has sent. And say, we don't like it. It's horrible. We hate it. We wish we didn't have to have this. Now, see, when we put these things into real context, 21st century, can you understand how we can be guilty of doing the same things when God is doing the same things for us? So in the wonderful imagery of the Old Testament writers, they showed the bite of discouragement and its consequences. And they put it like this in verse 6. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. Poisonous snakes. I'm, I'm, I'm past the point of the argument of is this allegorical? Is this actual? You know, if it was actual, bless them. What a horrible thing to go through. For us, it's allegorical in the sense that this image, this picture, is translated to us, and I could show you in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 3 how it says these things happen for our example, to give us a lesson. Well, we're not going to have fiery serpents. It's not snakes on a plane. Snakes in a church, okay? But the imagery is very, very powerful. The imagery of this thing about fiery serpents coming and biting the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, make, uh, uh, sorry, let's come back to verse 7. Then the people came to Moses, no, 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 verse 6, sorry. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people and many of the people of Israel died. There's the poison that comes when discouragement is not dealt with. And we can become the serpent to someone else. We can bite them with our concepts with our distorted understanding, with our affected beliefs, to the point where they become poisoned just as if they had been bitten by a snake. And I know for a fact that there are people in our community who have been bitten by the snake of discouragement and are carrying that poison and will die of what it is that has been said, what it is that they feel has been done, unless something happens to change that. Every one of them who was bitten was going to die. It says, and many of the people of Israel died, and some already have, for the reasons we've talked about. Verse 7, therefore the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses very graciously prayed for the people, but I want you to notice the flaw in the request which is common to most of us. Not take away the cause, not deal with the cause, take away the consequence. 
right? They didn't come saying, Moses, we've sinned. Please help us to grasp why it is that we are now being bitten, why it is that we are dying under this poisonous bite. Help us to understand. They said, just take away the pain. Take away the problem. And that so often is our attitude to these things. Just take away the consequence, but don't, don't make me deal with the cause. But God gave Moses a solution based in mercy and grace, which I like. The solution is always based in mercy and grace. It's never in retribution. It's never in running. It's never in condemnation. It's never in judgment. The solution to everything in life is always based in mercy and grace. And verse 8, Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, anyone bitten by the serpent of discouragement, remember the soul of the people was discouraged on the way, the root of the problem was not snakes, the root of the problem was discouragement in the soul. The snakes were what happens physically to what was happening internally. Can you see the picture? What happens to us physically because of what is happening internally, that then we have to be healed physically, but we have to fix what's going on internally. And if you've, if you've recognized anything, still the symbol for medical doctors is, this, is the bronze serpent on the pole. It's on the logo of all medical treatment, the bronze serpent on the pole comes from this very story because the idea was if you will look to this, you will live even though at the moment you are poisoned and you are dying. So that's what the solution based in mercy and grace God gave to Moses. Now Jesus repeated that solution for us. So in John chapter 3 in the New Testament and verse 14 it says, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, this is Jesus talking, even so must the Son of Man, that's Jesus, be lifted up, that whoever believes on him should not perish, but have eternal life. So Jesus draws a parallel between the situation the children of Israel were in in the desert and the erecting of the bronze serpent on the pole to what he was about to do on the cross and say, this is the equivalent for you to what that was for them, which means that we've been bitten, we've been poisoned, we're discouraged, but this is the answer for us. And now what's interesting, let me just, let me just break a couple of things here because what that shows is A, that Jesus knew the Scriptures... And B, there was a parallel lesson in the story, even though literal serpents were not present. No literal serpents, but there was a parallel to the problem. That parallel for us is this dealing with encouragement. And the parallel being, in Jesus' words, in my paraphrase, what you're looking at and what you believe about that will affect your life for ages. Because he said, whoever believes in him, that's a change of belief. Remember we said belief is at the root. Whoever believes in him, in Jesus, in who he was, what he was representing, how he told us to deal with one another, it says, will not perish but have eternal life. Now, of course, there are major issues on translation things from church culture. And uh, eternal life is an interesting one because actually in Greek, it means aeonis. And it means, it means Zoe, it means ages of life, ages of life. So I like to translate it this way. What you're looking at and what you believe about that will affect your life for ages. Let me say that again, because this is the root of your discouragement. What you're looking at and what you believe about that will affect your life for ages. And so the solution to discouragement is found in verse 8 and verse 9 of our root scripture. And I'm going to give you the four things, and then I'm going to offer you a prayer. Here's the four things. Number one, change the focus of your attention. What are you looking at? See, the first secret to dealing with the poison was to change the focus of your attention. Whoever will look at the bronze serpent on the pole. In other words, it was saying, if you keep looking where you're looking... 
you keep believing what you're believing, and the poison will not leave you, and ultimately it will kill this aspect of your life, that aspect of your life, some aspect of your life. So what's the first solution to discouragement? Change the focus of your attention. What are you looking at is the question you need to be asking yourself. What am I looking at in this situation? Number two, believe that the crucified Christ is the supernatural answer to the poison now within you. All the stuff you're feeling, all the distrust, the, the, the judgments, the condemnations, the doubts, the disillusionments, all that stuff that's going on in your discouragement, believe the crucified Christ is the supernatural answer to the poison now within you. In other words, let his love heal you and grace flow from you. Don't hang on to it. Don't bear your grudge. Bear one another's burdens instead. Let his love heal you and grace flow from you. Because if you don't, discouragement will kill you. It will take you out. It will take you away. Number three. Accept there needs to be a realigning of your perception. This is a very important one. Accept there needs to be a realigning of your perception. You know what perception is? Perception is what you think you see. How did you perceive what you saw? What do you think you see? That's your perception. There has to be a realigning of your perception. Remember all the things that we said, they came against God and against Moses. You brought us in this desert to die. We have no food. We're, this is terrible. We're all... It's a perception. Accept there needs to be a realigning of your perception. Here's my question. Are you seeing it as God sees it? When you think about what you feel, about what it is you're feeling about... The question is, are you seeing it as God sees it? Or are you expressing it from the discouragement that's come because you won't move your sight away from what it is that's causing that belief? And here's number four. Be willing to be delivered from the cause, not just the consequence. Good Lord, that means we have to let go of stuff. Because there's not one of us who becomes discouraged, who has a fight, who has a change of belief, who doesn't feel in their heart of hearts that they are fighting a just cause and that they have just cause to feel that way about this and about that and about this person, about that person. I am doing it because. I am doing it because. Which means I am justified in this and the problem is our discouragement never gets healed because we're not willing to be delivered from the cause we just want to be delivered from the consequence. So if you're willing to be delivered from the cause, not just the con consequence, that's the key. So as healing flows inward, then let healing flow outward. See, you're not going to fix it by what flows out here. You're going to fix it by what flows in here. And what flows in here, when you let it flow out, will fix what's going on out there. So you actually become a solution to the problem. I rather can see these people bitten by the snakes and poisoned by all that had gone on and discouraged in their soul, that once some of them had looked at this serpent and found the poison disappeared, and now they had a different perception of the problem, and their belief had shifted, I think they would be going around encouraging people who were on their last legs to say, no, look, let me lift you up, let me prop you up. You've just got to look at the serpent on the pole. You've got to look at the love of Jesus. You've got to look at that sacrificial love, what it's saying about you, and you will be healed. Not take them away from that. So, if that's you tonight, I have a prayer. We're going to share in a prayer if you'd like to share in the prayer. It's actually a written prayer. It's one I read online today. I've adjusted it a little bit in the places where it was wrong. No, I've adjusted it a bit in places where it would just express where our heart is in this message tonight. And so I want to ask you, if you are discouraged, will you pray this prayer? If you say, I'm only discouraged a little bit, that's like saying, I only got bit by the snake two seconds ago. The result is the same. Little bit, lot, utterly distraught with discouragement. The cause is the same. 
the solution is the same and the miracle is the same. I actually believe this wonderful story is a message down the ages to us for such a time as this to say to all you people who get discouraged in church, out of church, in life, out of life, in marriage, out of marriage, with people, not with people, to all you people there is an answer to the discouragement that's in your soul This has affected what you are believing about the situation that changes your perception that now you are dying from, but you have an opportunity to look to the cross, to look to the Christ, to look to the serpent who hung there for us. And someone is just in quietness. I just just want you to bow your heads just for a moment. This, This is more just in respect to people. And um, I just want you to consider whether, whether you are willing to pray this from your heart. And uh, if you are, then we're going to pray this prayer together. And uh, this could be the turning point for you. This could be the moment of transformation. It can be the moment that turns the tide from you dying from all the stuff that's poisoning you to you beginning to live and be a source of grace and mercy to others. Now, obviously, you can't pray the prayer with your eyes closed and your heads bowed. But I'm going to pray this prayer, and if you'd like to pray this prayer, I want you to pray it out loud, sincerely, and uh, maybe we should stand. Maybe, maybe, Maybe we should just change our position and if you don't want to pray it but that's fine I uh, the last thing I encourage is hypocrisy Um, but if you honestly have something has resonated in your spirit tonight and you can say yeah that's me in some degree or another then I want us to pray this prayer and believe for healing and then as we leave this place tonight things are going to be different yeah so here we go are you ready this is the prayer Lord In my discouragement, I have become critical and cynical. Bitter, not beautiful. More aware of how others have failed me than how Jesus loves me. More resentful than reasonable. More blameful than responsible. Father, melt my heart with mercy. Gentle me with your grace and humble me with my own reality, restore in me the joy of your free, rich salvation. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So go and be different. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. And why not support the rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.